first of all, I just want to say thanks for, to the Columbia um, School of Business for hosting this. Thanks for having diversity and inclusion to close out the day. I think it's a really strong statement on inclusion. Oftentimes, these conversations happen in some back, uh, far away panel room, but um, it's front and center here, so that's really encouraging. I'd love to begin by introducing our panelists. Um, first to my left, I have here Karen Dell. Uh, Vescovo from Microsoft. Karen is Vice President of Microsoft Northeast Region, providing executive leadership in the Northeastern states, spanning from Maine to Virginia. And in this role, she's responsible for a two and a quarter billion dollar annual business and leads enterprise sales team. Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, she'd been at Broad Vision and LexisNexis. Uh, Karen's a member of a large extended family, and she and her husband have been married for 26 years with two children. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Karen. Thank you. Anushka Salinas is uh, to her to the left, uh, to our left here. She is Chief Revenue Officer of Rent the Runway. Um, and fun fact, she started at Rent the Runway as an intern while um, in CVS. Uh, she's a, before that, she was a buyer at Lord & Taylor, went to Penn undergrad, and graduated from Columbia School of Business. Um, she also ran e-commerce for Hudson's Bay. And Anushka is the mother to a seven-year-old son. Welcome, Anushka. Uh, Deepak uh, Chugani is CEO of Savvy Cargo, uh, which is a logistics startup and uh, backed by Y Combinator. Um, prior to this, he was a Kairos director and fellow and holds a BS from Bentley University. Fun facts about Deepak, he was actually born in Kenya, grew up in Ecuador, and his parents are Indian. So welcome to our panel. <laughs> Cool. Um, before we dive in, I think it's always helpful to do some grounding in uh, what is diversity and inclusion. It sometimes means many different things to many different people. Some people think of DNI as one singular concept, but they're actually two really distinct concepts, and it's important to, um, to start on that basis. Diversity being the simple fact of who is represented in the group. Diversity is a characteristic of a group. It's not a characteristic of an individual. Inclusion, on the other hand, is, is how are people treated? Do people feel respected? Do they feel valued? Um, those are the real differences, I would say, between diversity and inclusion. Some people have their favorite metaphors. Diversity is being invited to the party or being at the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance or being comfortable enough to dance. Pick your metaphor. Um, whatever it is, it's helpful to understand that they're distinct. Um, if anybody wants to add anything to that, do you at your companies define it any differently? Um, anything to, to add to that? Does that sound yeah, fitting? Very similar. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, so our first question for the panel um, is, according to recent research, diversity can yield tangible financial benefits to firms. Have you found this the, to be the case in your own businesses? And can you talk about an example? Um, yeah, actually, we. We are very focused on diversity, especially in my business where we deal with um, customers in large cities. We want to make sure that we're representative of the market that we sell into. But in terms of what we see internally um, around inclusiveness, we actually have something called workplace analytics that tracks sort of not people's every movement, but how they collaborate and interact with others. And what we found in my organization, um, the folks that are at the top of sort of the, the, the stack in terms of achieving their revenue targets and transforming their customers and doing, you know, doing very strategic things with their, their customer set, those that are um, the most successful are like 25% more collaborative and 25% more inclusive, meaning they have a much broader network of people that they work with you know, on a regular and consistent basis. So, what we're finding is people who really include more and engage more have better results. And I think it's pretty, um, pretty telling in terms of what we see in our business. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool example. Um, I would say we're a little bit unique as a business, Rent the Runway. We started really, I think, more than 60% of our company is women. Um, so from the very beginning, we had a very female dominated company. Um, we have always struggled, as does everybody, to attract technical talent that are you know, as well balanced as some of the rest of the company is. Um, and we've seen that where we've been able to attract female talent to work on our consumer facing products, it, it drives outsized results. And specifically because when you have people working on actually building the products that, you're, that are serving the customer from the ground up that actually are the consumer, 
you, you get kind of magical results. And where we've been able to do that over the last three to four years, specifically on kind of our technology team that's been building the subscription business, we've seen kind of outsized results in terms of people not only doing kind of the task at hand, but being able to dig in and say, what about this? And what if we were to build this a feature this way? Because I've seen kind of firsthand as a consumer of the product that this would make it better. So I think for us, we've definitely seen, um, specifically on the technology side, um, that that's driven amazing results for us. Yeah, very cool. And the subscription product is an amazing innovation. Thank I you. love it. Thank you. Um, and Deepak, your company's a bit younger, so maybe you want to yeah. tell us a little bit about what your business does. Yeah, so we're, we're something called a tech-enabled freight forwarder. We help companies ship cargo around the world and use technology to make that process less painful. Um, but to answer the question you were talking about, how it drives the bottom line, we're an international company by nature. Um, so in our business, you have to be I don't know what's the right word given the terminology we're using, but you have to have representation from different cultures. You have to be able to relate to people. So we have people in Mexico, we have people in Morocco, uh, we have people in a couple places in the US. And then just, you mentioned my cultural background. Those things help us get customers, help us relate, help us do business. Um, so it's pretty much, I think, impossible to do this kind of business if you don't at least have a respect for you know, diverse cultures and backgrounds. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get into trouble, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think and regulations also, right? Yeah, yeah. Speaking for for Uber a bit, um, Uber began like our original tagline was "Everyone's private driver," and I think about like how narrow a market black car chauffeur ing is as a business, and then where we grew to eventually as a company. Um, some of our fastest growing markets are in Latin America, where a lot of our customers are paying with cash. But initially, when the company was really only reflective of talent in Silicon Valley, um, people didn't see that as an opportunity. When you come from a community where, hey, some, not all people have bank accounts even, um, it was amazing to watch the, the bottom line grow um, in that regard. And one point on that is nowadays with how expensive it is to hire engineering talent or great people in startup hubs and how hard it is to retain people, if you're diverse and you have some kind of connection abroad, um, that can drive the bottom line in a very meaningful way. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Um, going into innovation and, and um, diversity and inclusion, one important area where this came up on the prior panel, right, with um, Amazon and AI, um, a lack of diversity can impact innovation in the way data sets train algorithms. And sometimes those data sets don't reflect the way that the real world looks. Um, one example, a few years ago, Google had some imaging um, labeling software, and there weren't enough black individuals or Africans or African Americans in the data set. So when it showed a picture of um, a black person, it was giving the label gorilla. Um, the public noticed this and Google took out, you know, gorilla from the, the data set. Um, and now a lot of our companies are serving government contracts, doing a lot of work that can have some profound social implications. Um, yet most DNI programs are housed under HR. Mm -hmm. So for your businesses, how do you how do you weave DNI into the product and into business practice? How do you keep that link strong so that um, we're really reaping the benefits as we grow to become more diverse and inclusive? I you know I think what what has been really interesting working with Microsoft, especially I would say uh, since Satya has been our CEO, is there is a great focus on you know, inclusiveness in all of the products. And there's a big push on accessibility across the, the business solutions that we sell into organizations. Um, but I think some of the things that we, we see coming out, products we see start coming out, are things like this adaptive controller that we have for Xbox. Um, I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl, you probably saw an ad around it where uh, people have physical limitations that they really struggle to play video games with the normal controllers. Um, and what is so empowering about the adaptive controller is that in a world of a gamer community, people don't see their disabilities and they're able to participate um, as actively you know, in that community with a controller that really helps them compete. And so you know, th there is a focus on making sure that all can participate use and access uh, the, the solutions that we have in market. Um, I saw recently too, like a woman, we encourage all of our engineering talent to really take risks. Um, 
a woman created a watch that helped a woman with Parkinson's be able to write her name again for the first time in like, you know, five years. Um, it, it somehow stopped the tremors in her hand as she, as she wore it. So things like that really are being implemented and put into the technology that we end up selling to the community. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think at Rent the Runway, we try to, to connect kind of the growth areas for the business with the talent that we have. And I think an example of that is, you know, plus size or what has historically been called plus size and now is more called inclusive sizing. You know, as a business, when we first started, we essentially reflected the market that the designer clothing offered. So size zero to 12, which is, as I'm sure many of you know, not quite representative of the average American woman, which I think is size 14 or 16. Um, so we were literally not even representing the average woman in the business that we first launched. And over time, we began to realize, both because our employees were starting to demand it and because we were hearing it from our customers, that we needed to be serving a much broader set of customers. And I think that's, we've, we've done that. We've actually gone and partnered with a designer community that didn't even want to necessarily make clothing in this size to, to get them to um, kind of even produce uh, incredible designer fashion for women above a size 12. And we've done that, and a lot of that has come from you know, both having people in-house that demand that, as well as our consumers, and then that also kind of drives this flywheel of us needing to bring in more women that are of larger sizes so that they represent our consumers and they can help us understand the consumer mindset and help us build that product in a better way. So I think you know, what I've experienced at Rent the Runway is as we've gotten more broad in who we're targeting, you know, in this case, a, a larger size woman, you know, very soon it'll be more women of color and different communities and different, different socioeconomic backgrounds. It also, in some ways, forces us to bring more of those people into our employee base to help us make sure that we're really representing our customers well, too. So I think there's kind of that connection between internal and external as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's maybe to add a different point of view at, at our stage, you know, we're a little under 10 people. It's really hard to prioritize diversity and inclusion when your focus is on, you know, survival, growth, fundraising, things like that. Um, but I like to think that the reason we can kick it a little bit down the can is because of are diverse and international nature already, but um, I've, I think that's an interesting debate, is at what point does it actually start? Should it become a priority and does it in practice for a lot of companies like Rent the Runway or Uber? Um, but yeah, we, we actually don't consider it at all at, at this stage to add you know, another perspective. It's, it's really hard to think about that. You know? But it sounds like you have prioritized it. Right, it was more natural, right? right. Uh, and I think it's because of my background and it's like, oh, you know, well, we know these really smart people in Mexico for this function, well, we're gonna hire them. And that adds another culture to the mix or my own culture, or you know, we're hiring people in New York and then our engineers, some of them are in Morocco. And so there's, I think there's like under 10 people, but there's four countries, three religions already, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a bit inherent. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you were starting. Yeah. Similar, it was similar for us. Very yeah. inherent from the beginning. Lots of women, lots of people of color. And I think when you don't start from that place, you all of a sudden have a 15 person company where everybody looks the same. And then exactly. you're intentionally trying to hire one person that comes in and feels like they don't belong. And that 100%. becomes really challenging. 100%. Yeah. And I've heard of that many times that it's really hard for some companies because the best way to not make a hiring mistake is to find someone in your network yeah. who someone can vouch for. I mentioned that earlier today. But if, you, if it's not inherent, then quickly it's like 10 people that look exactly the same, talk about the same things, are all guys talking about things that would make maybe a woman uncomfortable or you know, it becomes challenging to break it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think too, as a company scales, that's one of those points where it becomes very tempting to just hire this profile again and again and again, whether it's someone who worked at a certain company or someone who went to a certain school, and sometimes that can align with certain gender or ethnic um, backgrounds and you're already down a path that you didn't intend to be on. So I think in the early stages, um, and for myself, like with the historical memory I have at Uber, when I started at Uber, it was 2013. Um, people came from all over. It was a very small team, just a couple hundred people. And it was people who were crazy enough to join a startup. You're taking this big risk. Um, that's not necessarily going to be a, a profile of Bain, McKinsey, whatever you know, ends up happening later in an operations company. Um, and I wish that we had recognized earlier on, I think, all of those things that make people unique mm -hmm. when you hire them, um, whether that's because of the perspective that they bring or the market that they recognize, mm -hmm. um, and really kept that as, as we grow. Um, and I think that's something that 
I hope startups are starting to recognize as the DNI conversation is becoming more, uh, more prevalent. I think that's been that's one of the biggest challenges for Microsoft historically has been um, we had very f small female representation when I started. I was often one of the only females in a meeting in a room for a long period of time, um, and it was mostly men who were in the organization seen as software developers. It's still challenging to get women in interested in STEM careers. Um, but there's been a lot of improvement over time. But we've had to put a lot more focus on it to get where we needed to go, as opposed to, um, you know, I think in other places where they might start organically with a more diverse work workforce. Yeah. And I, I just kind of transitions nicely into the next set of questions, which is around what actually works. Mm -hmm. And I think about like the job descriptions we had earlier on, which there's a lot written about this. There's a ton of yeah. research. Um, you can put in your job description, we want rock star ninja, whatever <laughs> super aggressive um, you know, um, person that you're looking for, but you're taking people out of the running who don't mm -hmm. think of themselves like that. And there are also things that um, research shows that women, for instance, won't apply to a job unless they meet every single requirement or nice to have. Um, what is actually required for the job that you're looking for? Because you're looking for someone who can do the job. You're not necessarily looking for someone to just check a dozen boxes. And sometimes you go on a job site and you see, oh, I want 12 years in private equity. I want this or that. Well, is that really what you're looking for? Or are you looking for someone with a certain track record, mm -hmm. which could extend beyond? private equity or management consulting. Um, so, you know, banks, law firms, they've established this kind of set of programs, women's leadership programs, sponsorship programs, employee resource groups, um, targeted recruitment. Those are kind of the traditional things that companies do to improve DNI. Are there certain formal initiatives or maybe informal initiatives, like what do you do that you think actually helps people feel like they belong or helps attract um, broader candidates? You know, I, I think we, ha like here's what I would say, I think we have all of those, yeah. right? Like um, I was proud, my part of my team just um, rang the bell on, on Wall Street to celebrate 30 years of, the, of BAM Blacks at Microsoft, which I think is really kind of cool. Like we're, our company is much older than that. So, you know, to know that we have that kind of employee resource group for that long. And, and certainly, like, that whole community has grown. Um, but I, I think what, you know, we have all those resources. We do look at our job descriptions. All the things that you talked about, I think, exist within a large company. But when my team and I meet, what we talk about is some things that are very local. How do you really make people feel included, especially in a world where technology enables you to be separate? Right? Like we have so much technology that enables people to work remotely. Um, and we do silly things like we have a technology called Teams, which is where we all collaborate. It's our you know, threaded chat and it's where we meet. And I oftentimes put like silly things out there, little gifts and stuff like that. People will feel more related to me and, and they'll re be more responsive when you sort of put yourself out there in a little bit of a different way. So it's some of the way that we communicate and collaborate. And then, you know, in our office here in New York, we do things that really help bring people into the office and help them get connected. And so that isn't really necessarily about diversity as much as it is about wanting to retain our employee base, wanting to have good community, um, and wanting people to feel included and part of something. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we don't have as many kind of formal programs. We're not as large a company. I think in corporate, we're about 250 people. And in our retail stores and warehouse, we're just shy of 2,000. Um, about six months ago, we um, equalized benefits for all of those people across corporate and um, kind of even our hourly employees. We gave um, you know, maternity benefits to both men and women that were equal, as well as to all of our warehouse and retail associates. And I think that, like, that level of um, that level of benefit really kind of shows to the employee base that we actually do care everyone is included and we're not kind of discriminating against you because you didn't go to a four-year college and you didn't grow up in a certain type of family so I think walking the walk is really important beyond just kind of saying that you're that you're inclusive or saying that you're a diverse company and those are expensive choices mm -hmm. um, to make as a company but if you prioritize wanting to be kind of fair and equal to everyone then you have to 
you have to go so far as to do things like that. And I think from a financial standpoint, it has cost us, but we have definitely seen that in terms of employee happiness and retention um, and people truly feeling included and like they're kind of part of the family that we sort of say we are. So I think things like that have been really important. I think on the um, recruiting side, for us, it's been very much about um, it's organic, right? So if you have lots of women and people of color, those people help bring in and make comfortable other women and people of color. And so like we were saying, it all starts from the beginning. So if you start with kind of a lopsided team from the beginning, it will only continue to grow that way, mm -hmm. which I think makes it much more challenging for larger companies who are kind of facing um, a historical workforce that's been around a long time. Yeah, completely. It's, it's funny, the, the question you asked, I don't think we talked about this backstage, but we recently changed our business a few months ago to what we're doing now. The previous idea actually tackled this problem. So it was trying to improve the pipeline for the company. So we would try to give people from non-traditional backgrounds coaching so they could get um, some of these jobs. So it's kind of from my own story coming from a non-Ivy League school and getting these investment banking jobs and things like that. And so I studied that problem pretty intensely. And uh, I think the programs work to a certain degree. They still tend to work for the people who get the information. So for example, SEO is an amazing nonprofit. If you don't know it, it helps um, you know, Latinos and, and African Americans get jobs on Wall Street more than anything. And um, they will try to get on campuses, they'll find the people, and they'll coach them, and then they'll help them get the offers. And those things are really effective. The thing is, even those are selective, and there's a limit on all these things. But even from the other founders I spoke with in the recruiting space, trying to understand that problem, it seems that the big problem is, if your applicant funnel is 100 people, and it's equally represented like the population, so let's say there's 20% of every race, every orientation, you know, whatever, whatever categories you want to include, um, the ones that end up making it down the funnel very early on are the ones that tend to come from some of those schools and backgrounds. And you'd be surprised it's not because just they come from those schools, it's because they have information that allows them to pass through the next screens, whereas the people who don't, um, they'll stumble on their interviews because they didn't have that extra 10% of preparation and they, they fall off. And I, I just have it on good authority that that's usually where the problem is because the employers, as you know, this panel, they do want to hire diverse. They're just like, we just couldn't find that person from this background who made it to the third round, right? Um, this is what we have. These are the people that meet our requirements. We can't lower the bar for diversity. And so I think that's where there, there has to be some solutions around coaching people who don't come from the traditional backgrounds, right? Yeah, and, and I take a tack where um, I think that the trend that I see in my company and with our peers and as DNI practitioners is that it's not all about coaching the applicant. Some of this is about coaching the screener and the interview panel because human bias is a thing and mm -hmm. this is a human process. And when I, you know, it's, it's interesting, okay, if the people who are getting through have happened to have an Ivy League background, well, maybe the interview also does, and it's some pattern matching going on, and suddenly it, it's a little bit less about the bar, which is requirements for everyone, and they're standardized, um, and a little bit more about what, what um, homophily, right? Like what makes you feel comfortable is, is what your identity is. We do, I was thinking about it when you were speaking earlier, we, every year we have to go through bias training um, and it always sparks some really interesting conversations within the organization because people start to realize, like, I didn't even know I was, you know, sort of had a bias for that or I was thinking about something that way. Um, and we also focus on, we have 10 inclusive behaviors that we try and, you know, educate and, and promote within the organization. And a lot of that is really just, I, I think there's some self-education about being curious. I think it's fascinating. We had, an, we had an, a green room conversation that was about, like, um, genetics and diversity, and you know, I think it's about being curious and seeking to learn and understand others as well. Yeah, absolutely. We have a few minutes left, and I'd love to take questions from the audience. We have mic runners, I believe, on either side. Oh, oh I see. One over here. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hi, my name is Lenore Cantor, and I do growth consulting and leadership coaching with different high growth businesses. Um, I'm curious, um, well, I had two questions. One was about uh, hiring people through these virtual platforms where you don't know their name, you can't see you know, anything about them other than their skills. So I'm wondering if any of you are employing that. 
And then um, the other question is related to, um, you know, how, are you being impacted by the distributed virtual workforce as well? Because I'm wondering if there is this opportunity as people start to work more remotely, how that impacts the way teams function and how you're thinking about that. Because if you're not in the same room with people and you can't see the expression and, and sort of their reactions and we've got all these issues around communication. So I'm just interested in hearing how you're thinking about approaching that within your organizations. Thank you. I, I can address the second one better than the first. We don't do virtual hiring like that. I'm, I'm not sure that the company does. I, I only know that for my business, you know, we don't. Um, my organization is about 500 people and they're spread across the Northeast. We have to think about how do we collaborate better. Um, we are more focused now about people being on camera when they're in meetings. Um, I've, I've noticed my own behaviors improve in a way when I am um, on you know, a webcam and people can see me. Um, I feel more connected to the meeting. I feel more connected to the people that are part of the meeting. Um, we do, there's certainly like a visual representation of everybody in my organization that I can get to very quickly so that I can see who they are um, and make that visual connection. But we do try and focus on collaborating much better through technology, using cameras, making sure people can be heard, right? That's another big thing, like can everybody hear? Um, do we have the right camera angle? Can you hear them through the, the microphones? You know, just to be respectful of people. Otherwise, they don't feel like they're part of it. Yeah, I would agree. Video conferencing is, is huge mm -hmm. for us. We're just opening our first offshore um, office in Ireland mm -hmm. for um, technology and data science. And so it's a big concern for us to make sure that even just internally, we already use video conferencing. But now that we're opening up kind of a satellite office in another country, it's going to be even more important yeah. that that we utilize video. So every single room is video enabled. And, and in addition to Slack and things like that, um, for meetings, we really encourage video. To add 30 seconds of the startup perspective, we're basically remote company. You could think of it yeah. that way. And um, very early on, I realized we had to over communicate so that people would feel included. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you just have to have certain mechanisms. And um, I've heard many companies, even you know, within Y Combinator, during my batch, we had Zapier, which is a company that has no headquarters, talk about how they build their culture remotely. And uh, the key takeaway is that's where the world is going. It doesn't mean every, no com not most companies aren't going to have headquarters, but it requires you to start over communicating sooner. It requires you to have some kind of weekly check-ins. It requires you to ha try to have you know, personal FaceTime. You'd also be surprised at how much like emojis and just writing clearly mm -hmm. make people feel comfortable, especially mm -hmm. when there's this boss employee dynamic. Mm -hmm. I, I find I can't be too serious or um, I don't know, it feels like not the best dynamic. Um, but those are all things that's where the world is going and uh, there's ways that it can be great and I think there's ways that it can be bad. It's just, it, it gets down to the details, right? And, and the personality of the people and things like that. Yeah. And I think the talent profile is different in different geographies yeah. as well. So like we have a tech center in Bulgaria and Sofia where a much higher percentage of working software engineers are women. Um, so it's smart for us if we want more diverse engineering teams to open an office in Bulgaria. Um, also in Toronto um, and India, just being more distributed can garner wins in that way. Mm -hmm. um, we have some groups within the company operating on like blind resume screens and things like that. But I think what's important is that companies, companies hold their hiring process really near and dear. And they're not going to experiment. Or, you wouldn't roll out a business experiment 100%, right? You would like test it with 2% of users and, and see what happens. I've seen some research to the contrary about blind resume review that people will then look for other indicators um, what clubs were they in? What kind of schools did they go to? Um, and it might not yield the results that you're looking for. So um, I've heard that too. Yeah, yeah. The, the experimentation, I think, is an important piece of it and making sure you're getting the right results. Someone in the audience brought up a great question before about Amazon testing out screening resumes, right? And the result was not what they expected. Um, I'm glad to hear that they pivoted quickly. One more question. We'll, we'll use the mic so we make sure everyone can hear. Um, I came for all of you, but especially for Deepak, we 
Let, hold on, let's please use the mic. <laughs> Hi, sorry. So I'm kind of curious when you're looking at recruiting from non-traditional backgrounds and especially from different schools and different areas, you know, I, I really know that piece that like last mile, you know, there's so much culture that gets involved there and how you're expressing yourself, anticipating the questions. What do you find is the most helpful preparation or way of changing the interviews so that you're not doing that, you know, when you guys are, are hiring or coaching or whatever it is that you've done? Changing the interviews, I wouldn't know because that would mean an entrenched process that they try to change with that specific goal. I haven't done that. But what we find the most helpful with what we did with the lobby and what I've seen with other founders in the recruiting space is some kind of a coaching from people who are on the inside, right? Like if you think of why the diversity issues happen, it's, it's not just because everyone's biased towards Harvard and Stanford. It's because the person who gets the job from Harvard or Stanford then coaches his frat brother or the sorority sister or, and they just get all of these insights on how they have to be portrayed or like the tricks and secrets of what they're gonna be reading for in your body language and how you speak. And, and those are all really nitty gritty things that just don't get taught to people who don't come from those circles. Uh, I don't have a solution for it. That's why we pivoted. It was a really hard business model, uh, but some scalable way to get coaching to the people who need it uh, and give them, give them those insights or have the companies increasingly figure out ways to screen candidates without including those biases, right? But it, it, it's hard, especially for roles that are not technical in nature, where you can just measure the hard skills mm -hmm. and they can learn it online. It's, it's very tricky. Like we focus a lot on finance where, yes, you'd think they're just like modeling tests. It's not really like that at the entry level. It's a lot about the attitude and the learning. And so they'll judge you on how you speak and, and even how you're dressed sometimes. And that creates a whole host of debates around like socioeconomic backgrounds. And so, um, it, it's a hard problem, but I think just coaching the right people and if you guys have great jobs, if someone spams you on LinkedIn and they just wrote in a way that's annoying, just answer three questions over LinkedIn mail. Like I always try, even if I can't hop on a call, and you'd be surprised, it helps. Mm -hmm. And from a DNI practitioner perspective, standardize interviews, standardize interviews, standardize interviews. You want to make sure that your whole team is tra trained on how to interview, that they're using approved questions from a question mm -hmm. bank, that the panel is consistent, and that people are being judged on the same level. Because um, it can be very dangerous in a startup. There's not a lot of preparation. You get in a room and you, how did you feel with this person? Oh, I felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, if the person's different than you, chances are you didn't feel comfortable. Um, and that can lead to less diverse hiring. But when you have a team that's committed to a structured process, chances are you're going to have a much more rigorous debrief. And you're going to say, hey, did you ask John about financial modeling? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, we didn't get to that. We talked about crew or whatever. <laughs> um, <Growing. laughs> you want to check, have those checks and balances that I think really can be to the benefit of people from non-traditional backgrounds. I think that's about our time here. So I want to thank our panelists and thank the audience. Thank you. Thank you.